What do you think about when you think of raisins? Do you think about them as nature's candy, as a core part of a good trail mix, or do you think of them as little leather pieces that taste like the cardboard they come in? If I'm being honest, I usually fall into the latter camp, and that's what Nikiko Masumoto challenged me to change. You may have met Nikiko when we went up to Masumoto Farms last year to check out their peach harvest. My name is Nikiko Masumoto. I'm Yonsei, fourth generation Japanese American. And I say that because, specifically in relationship to this place and our farm, I'm the fourth generation to get to touch and work the same soil. I think there's something really valuable about better understanding things that you don't enjoy, in particular food. And so when Nikiko told me that they have an annual raisin harvest and invited me to check it out, it was an opportunity I couldn't say no to. So earlier this week, I packed up my car to head up to Central California. I'm Sean, I'm an About To Eat producer, and this is why I traveled 400 miles to eat raisins. So I wake up at 2.30 to get on the road by 3.30. It is 3.30 in the morning. There's no one else awake or it's people who are coming home from a late night. My plan is to drive from Los Angeles to Delray, California. It's about a three and a half hour drive, mostly in complete darkness. I arrive in Delray around 6.30 a.m. Just exited the freeway, about 10 minutes away from the farm. I've been here before, but I'm caught by how beautiful it is as the sun starts to rise. Wanted to get out of the car just to show you. I don't know if you can really tell, but the mountains are really epic out here. In a voicemail the night before, Nikigo tells me that when autumn comes, the valley starts to smell sweet with all the raisins. And it could have just been the power of suggestion, but it did smell sweet. And then I'm at the farm. I get quite a welcome from Nikiko and the three farm dogs who are going to be my guide during this day. Welcome to the Masamoto family farm. We're standing on our farmhouse porch on a beautiful morning looking out at our vineyards and orchards. The Central Valley is a major farming center. I've read it reported that it produces 25% of the nation's food. Within the United States, Again, I don't know like the exact up to 2022 statistics, but it's a the vast majority of raisins that are produced in the United States are grown within a 60 mile radius of where we're standing. That's wild. So traveling up here was kind of a necessity. Where are we going first? So we, we can check out our oldest vines right here in front of the, the farmhouse. Oh, they're right here. So raisins, apart from the obvious grapes turning into something else of it all, I don't really know how raisins happen. I uh, imagine some sort of drying rack or an industrial dehydration system, but that's not it at all. This is how sun-dried raisins are dried. Real quickly, I wanna share, and Nikiko told me I could share this. You, you can see here some of the, the bunches. Oh Nikiko, you can just talk. You don't have to see, you don't have to. It's okay. <laughs> Nikiko is pregnant right now. She's a few weeks away from her due date, so I asked her when she's gonna stop walking the farm, and she told me that she would stop when she goes into labor. Like our grandmothers, right? <laughs> Farmers are incredible. The green grapes, you can see the gradations of color. Th this is slowly turning purple, and so this needs more time. So Nikiko pulls a few different raisins. They're all in different stages of development, and that's where I try my first raisin of the day. The most recently picked, the green one, Oh. It was like eating the grapiest grape I've ever had. It still had a lot of the moisture from the grape, but had been lightly dehydrated, so the sugars were a little bit more concentrated. It's like trying chicken broth and better understanding what a chicken tastes like, but a, a grape, obviously. The second stage one tasted a little bit like wine, and the final one, which was the closest to finish, it just kind of tastes like a moist raisin. We walk out of the vines and Nikiko points me towards these, m this massive pile of bins. These are the bins that hold the raisins when they're done. They store the raisins when they're dry and then we deliver them to the raisin plant where the raisins are then cleaned and processed and packaged. She tells me that each holds about 800 pounds of raisins. And we're a small farm. <laughs> It's a lot of raisins considering that they're one small producer amongst many, many other farms that are producing raisins at the same time. The equipment is so, like these bins are so old. They're, they're like this living archive of memory that every year we pull out and use again. And the age of that equipment really reinforced for me how old the process is and how the process hasn't changed 
that much over the years, but that's when Moss shows up. So Moss Masamoto is Nikiko's dad. He's one of the friendliest uncles I think you'll ever meet. Uh, he is super excited to talk about not only the raisins themselves, but the history of the farm and what sets this organic farming system apart. We use the old school method in making raisins where you pick them, lay them out on paper trays in the sun, and in about three weeks they dry into raisins. A very simple natural process. The challenge with that is you don't get the high productivity. We'll get in a good year one and a half to two tons of raisin per acre. The modern systems are, you want three tons. Is the quality different? It's different. The flavor is different when it's dried on the vine versus our method where we dry it in the sun. I wanna be clear here, this is not a sponsored video, but you really get the sense of what a family operation the Masumoto farm is and has always been once you start talking to Moss. We're in the process of trying to figure out how do we fit in this shifting transition of the raisin industry. Uh, and maybe we don't. So what does that mean? I don't know. You know, I don't know. Once the raisins are dry enough on the tray, we then by hand roll the trays and then collect them. Cut, cut, and flip. In, yep and then you flip it over. Okay, so <laughs> without spilling. <laughs> These will get cleaned, right? Yes. Okay, great. Moss insists on showing me how raisins were produced in the old days. He pulls out these wooden trays and he tells me that they used to lay the raisins on wooden trays instead of pieces of paper and there would just be thousands of these trays. So if you had a small farm of 40 acres, you'd have, you know, 40,000 of these trays. He also pulls out these giant boxes and shows how they would fill these boxes of raisins. And then you just dump the tray in, dump the raisins in, and then you'd stack these on a wagon. The hoist would grab it, lift it, and then you'd stack it, and then you do the same when you deliver it uh, to the raisin processing. Or the other way you did it, and this is for your family, your grandmother and grandfather, right? This is 200 pounds of raisins plus the box, which is about 40 pounds. They would hand lift these. So this is maybe where I should share another reason why I wanted to come up here. So my dad grew up on a small farm, not too far from the Masumotos, maybe a couple miles. And in fact, after Nikiko and I met, we learned how my grandparents had known her grandparents. And of all the crops our family could have grown, my grandfather grew raisins, and that's what my dad grew up helping produce. I don't think they could afford to hire anyone, so it was, as far as I know, just my grandparents and my dad and my aunt and my uncle. I really did make this trip mostly out of an interest in, in learning more about what goes into this very overlooked pantry staple, but walking through vines that my grandparents might have walked through when they visited their friends decades before I was born. It was, it was really special. Yeah. You had to have teamwork. You had to be able to do it together. You had to have motion. So once you lift it, you don't want to stop. So it really was this partnership. So I imagine your grandfather and grandmother were a pretty good team doing that. There's a chant, right? Anyone who does physical work, if you do it rep repetitiously, you get a chance. It's the heave ho, well, Japanese at least, our clan used yoisho. Yoisho! <laughs> <laughs> What's the German equivalent? I have no idea. <laughs> so we head to the finished raisin bin. It's the moment of truth. Nikiko looks through the bins to pull some that she wants me to try. So here's like a handful. If you eat this and find some pleasure in it, then you just haven't had good raisins before. <laughs> hold this, hold this one. <laughs> and then I try a fresh raisin. At first, when I bite into it, I don't taste anything, actually. And then there's like a subtle caramel, kind of like what you'd expect out of a raisin, but it's a little bit more mellow. Usually when I eat raisins, I hit like an unpleasant sour situation, and instead, for this raisin, it just became really juicy, like bordering on milkiness, like when you put cream in coffee. It's really good. <laughs> they won't let me leave empty handed so they pack me raisin chutney. Um, that Mrs. Masumoto made, and a jar of apricot jam, and uh, 
this bag of raisins to bring home, so here I am processing raisins. I don't think I left the farm craving the raisins that are readily available to me, but going up there did change what I think about when I think about raisins. Like all things in life, different perspective and deeper understanding are just gonna make things taste better. So I got to reshape the way I think about a food that I dismissed for years. I got to better understand how the staple gets to our tables. And I got to walk through vines that my grandparents undoubtedly walked through when visiting old friends. And two generations later, I got to reconnect with a friend of my own. Thank you for watching. Let me know if there are other things I should go out and try.